Oh, that students are in the street, be it Europe, be it Africa, and in America, they're going to try to rock you to sleep. Our job is to not let you go to sleep. Our job is to disrupt that pattern that you think you're here just to get a good job. We want you to have a good job. We know you're going to have to have your family. We got two comrades here. We both have been through full careers and, and, and even retired from them. But we never stop learning, never stop fighting to liberate our people and to move us forward. So with that, and again, please sign our table uh, information so that we can stay in contact with you. I want to read this brief bio on our guest speaker today. Nemesis, right? Nemesis. Nemesis. Yeah. We call it Nem, but Nemesis Richardson is an organizer with the All African People's Revolutionary Party and the All African Women's Revolutionary Union, which is our women's wing in our party, as well as a co-founder of the Thomas Sankara Center for African Liberation and Unity in Ouagadougou. Yeah. How do you say Ouagadougou. it? Ouagadougou. Burkina Faso. As a recipient of the Fulbright, oh, she gives talks and workshops on imperialism, anti-imperialism, and pan-Africanism. As a recipient of the Fulbright Student Award, she researched the history and the legacy of the revolution in Burkina Faso. While continuing to organize in Burkina Faso, she now works as a journalist for Africa, African Stream, where she covers historical and contemporary stories related to African unity, and the struggle against Western imperialism. She is also the communication director for the African Diaspora Alliance. So without further ado, our guest speaker today. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I think I'll just start off by greeting you how we greet people in Burkina Faso. So I'm going to say something that means how are you this afternoon, and you're going to respond lafi, which means I'm in good health. So why don't we just try that? Um, so I'll say ne winga, and now you'll say lafi. Uh, so that's uh, how we start everything uh, in Burkina Faso, where I live. Um, as our comrade Akabundu mentioned, I grew up here in San Jose. Um, I was born in, in San Jose, um, but I've been living in Burkina Faso for the past few years. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting for me to be back. Um, I don't, uh, I've been like so much on the ground in Burkina Faso that I don't have that well of a gauge right now in terms of how much people know about Africa and the struggles that are happening on the ground uh, in the Sahel region or across the continent. Uh, maybe just to start, could I get a show of hands of how many people are familiar with the term Sahel? How many people have heard of that term? Okay, a few hands, but not so many. So I think um, what we're going to do to start is I'm going to show you some visuals, some images from protests and some video clips. And I just want to get some reactions, some first impressions in terms of, yeah, like from a few people in terms of like what you feel when you see these images, um, if you have any impression uh, of what's going on or any background. So I'll start with Molly. So. This was a uh, protest in 2020. I'll keep going. Uh, this translates to death, death to France and French allies. <coughs> you can probably turn it up on the computer if you like. Stop. Faso, so we can see these images. Um, this sign is, these are targeting the 
former French ambassador to Burkina Faso, calling for his expulsion from the country. So this is no to French diplomacy. And this is uh, Luc Le Malade, so Le Malade Francais. So this is calling him basically like, um, like calling him basically crazy and sick and saying to get out of our country um, with his mercenaries uh, who have come to Burkina. So this is um, a protest targeted towards him. Uh, this is also, once again, in Burkina Faso. This was this year. And then we have this video clip. Okay, um, and then I'll show for one more country. Okay, so this is for Niger. Uh, this, these are recent. These uh, protests happened in the past, like, what is it, September, so in the past month, um, towards the end of August. So again, we see targeted protests against France. This here says France must leave. Um, long live Niger, down with France. And here's another video clip. This one, you can get some voices. Um, surprising or maybe you have seen some images of something in the news I actually don't like I said don't really have a gauge for uh, what a lot of people in the US are exposed to right now regarding the situation so I do just want to get some general thoughts anything that you know any impressions uh, if anybody wants to share yes uh, I was not very, at all aware of what was happening okay um, it seems like the common of the is like get rid of France. Get rid of France, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, I think, uh, hopefully those images made that pretty clear. We could see like France being like crossed out. There was France like a, almost like a pirate flag with a skull and bones. Um, French flags were burning. Uh, very true. Any, any other impressions or thoughts? Yes? <laughs> 
Oh, so I was thinking, are they saying that Russia, are, are they trying to get rid of the French uh, and the Russians, or is it just Okay, so you mentioned, do you notice that they talk about Russia as well? Um, so to give that, uh, to give clarification, so they are calling for France to leave, um, but they are calling for partnership with Russia. Okay. Other thoughts, reactions to that? Um, and I'll give some context. Yes. Can I say? <laughs> Well, given that you're there, every time I get the news from my friends, it's usually, oh my God, they're burning down, they're burning down. But when I got there, it wasn't looking like a burning down situation. It was more like a peaceful situation. Okay, That's so how I saw it. impressions. Like whenever I see it in the media, it's like, oh, they're all dying, Africa's killing each other. Okay, so like impressions from like a contrast between having been uh, on the ground in Burkina Faso, um, for a couple weeks uh, versus seeing it in the media. Okay, so that's, that's also really important and interesting. Um, so why don't I talk a little bit, since the Sahel, uh, oh yeah, sorry. Decolonization. Decolonization, okay, thank that's you. What comes to mind. Yeah, definitely, I definitely understand, uh, definitely understand that. So uh, why don't I explain a little bit about what the Sahel is, since it's not a term that most people here are familiar with. So the Sahel is a geographical region. It's a strip of land. It's uh, primarily in West Africa, but it actually well, it extends the continent, um, both West and East Africa, but I'll be focusing on uh, West Africa. And in a cultural sense nowadays, it's usually used more so to refer to West Africa. It's um, a part of Africa that sort of divides like North Africa from the rest of West Africa. So we have like coastal states like Ghana, like uh, Nigeria, um, and then we have the Sahara Desert. And so it's a land that's like right underneath the Sahara Desert, kind of arid, very hot, but it does have a rainy season. So it's not quite the desert, but it's kind of getting there. Um, the countries that uh, have, that are, we could say Sahelian more in the cultural sense, like when we use it more as a cultural term, um, are tied together through a history of big centralized kingdoms, uh, like have any of you heard of Timbuktu maybe? So there's like the Mali Empire, the Songhai, um, Songhai Empire, the Ghana Empire, so these big centralized states. Um, they're tied together through by also uh, Islam, so it's a primarily Muslim part of the world. Um, and then they also have all been subjected to French colonialism in this part of the Sahel specifically. So we're looking at countries like Senegal, Mauritania, uh, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Chad. Um, but for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to focus on Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso. Uh, because as you've seen in the protests, there's a massive revolt happening across these three countries um, that has already had uh, a tremendous impact on the level of like, the states of these countries. Uh, and that is actually, we could say, it's making a big impact, possible transformation on West Africa as an entire region right now. Um, so I'll give some historical context to begin with. So have any of you here heard of Tuma Sekara before? Is that a familiar name to some people? Okay, just a few people. Okay, so no worries. So Tuma Sekara was a revolutionary from Burkina Faso. Uh, I have him on my shirt. Um, and one moment, my laptop's not here, but I have him on my laptop. Clearly, I'm a fan. Um, so he transformed the country of Burkina Faso in the 1980s when he was in power for a period of four years. When he came to power in Burkina Faso, um, there was no Burkina Faso. The country was called Upper Volta, or Los Volta in French, uh, and it was a totally different state that was founded on very different values. Uh, it was a state that was created through French colonialism, um, the product of the Berlin Conference. Uh, the actual term, Upper Volta, had absolutely no meaning to the people. It refers to a river, but nobody calls it the Volta, except for like the French and Portuguese. Um, and it was a neo-colonial state where we, even after flag independence, all of the resources and wealth of the country was uh, pretty much directed to flow towards France and towards Europe. But during Thomas Sankara's four years in power, the country was uh, in many ways set on the path towards transformation. He was a revolutionary pan-African leader, he was a socialist, and he was um, 
an ardent anti-imperialist. So we see a, a, a period of time where Burkina Faso is modeling its economy as well as its politics and alignments kind of off of, in some ways, the Cuban Revolution, which was one of the biggest inspirations for Sankara. So if you're familiar with the Cuban Revolution at all, uh, or a little bit, you might have heard of uh, Committees for the Defense of the Revolution. That's, um, these are like grassroots organizations in the communities where people are able to put their input and, and create different campaigns. Thomas Sankara had the same sort of model within Burkina Faso. So we see a period of four years where the people of the country are mobilized to have campaigns like literacy campaigns where millions of people learn to read and write for the first time in history um, in French as well as in their local languages. We see uh, a vaccination campaign where in the span of just two weeks over two million children were vaccinated against uh, diseases like meningitis and yellow fever. Um, we have a period of history where Burkina Faso for the first time since uh, colonialism becomes uh, has uh, food sovereignty and so people are now consuming local food not relying on you know uh, uh, imported food from other parts of the world so it's a huge step towards having real self-reliance and and sovereignty but as I mentioned several times it was a period of four years so Thomas Sankara was overthrown uh, he was assassinated in an international conspiracy um, his right-hand man, who was part of this revolutionary struggle, Blaise Compare, pulled the trigger. But uh, this is also something that happened in connection with a, a system of both French and U.S. imperialism. So while it still hasn't been totally declassified, and um, there, it hasn't necessarily come to light the same way uh, this string of political assassinations across Africa in other places has, like in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, it is known that the CIA, as well as France, were implicated in the assassination of Thomas Sankara, and I can talk about that a little more, but um, I'm going to just keep going because there's so much information I want to share with you, and there's like so much context uh, to what's happening. So I'll come, I will come back to that, though. Uh, I just want to talk about a few other revolutionary figures from these three countries that are really inspiring what's happening on the ground right now, and who are being evoked um, as people are rising up against French neo-colonialism. So one of these figures is Modibo Keita, um, and another is Awa Keita, so both of them come from Mali. These are other Pan-African ancestors who fought for uh, sovereignty for Africa as well as African unity. Uh, so I just want to like, mention them so that way you can go and like, look into them some more because these are also um, figures that are having a big impact on the current political consciousness and climate. Uh, just to give a little context real quick, Modibo Keita was the first president of Mali, and he worked with Kwame Nkrumah and Ahmed Zekouture, the former presidents of Ghana and Guinea, to sign together um, an accord creating the Union of African States, which was um, an attempt to create something called the United States of Africa, this vision of Marcus Garvey, of very, uh, a long legacy of Pan-Africanists uh, to unify the African continent. So he worked tirelessly for that, and that's one reason why um, during these protests and up, these uprisings, uh, he's also uh, considered a big inspiration. Awa Keita, while she is lesser known, um, was at the forefront of organizing women, especially, to be engaged in the struggle for Pan-Africanism. Um, she was one of the founders of something called Pan-African Women's Day, and uh, she worked a lot with uh, organizing women who were in uh, labor unions and getting them um, in support of this Pan-African objective. And then real quick, I'll just talk about uh, this last part here, so I can also briefly share into this. Um, this is an image of Sarunya, who was uh, a freedom fighter. She was um, an African leader before the French colonial period, who, when the French arrived, led her people to fight against um, the French um, occupying armies and, and she held them off for a very long time so she's also being evoked right now as the symbol of resistance and I mentioned Sawaba which is a, a, Nigerian, a Nigerian um, uh, organization that also emerged during this era of the 60s around independence fighting again sort of in the same trajectory and legacy against imperialism and for African unity so I know this is a lot of info um, 
So I'm going to give a little more context to exactly what it is that people are fighting against and why. Um, so when Burkina, okay, so when the countries that were colonized by France gained their independence in the 1960s, um, it's very important to understand that the international context uh, that France was in meant that they could no longer hold on to their former colonies in the same way that they had historically, but they also, of course, did not want to lose their, their interest in the region, which is, um, it's very, very, yeah, it's very important. So France had their hands tied during this period of the 1960s because of the Algerian Revolution, which fought and won its independence against France through armed struggle, as well as the revolution in Vietnam, which again fought, waged war against France, and won that war against France. And so France is seeing, uh, in this period of decolonization in the 60s, these global uprisings against their empire. And they're trying to hold on to what they can, but it's very, very clear that the masses of people uh, across the colonized parts of the world uh, are not okay with the, col uh, the colonial situation and are demanding immediate independence. So what France does in Africa during this period, uh, the rest of Africa outside of Algeria, for the most part, outside of, the, of North Africa, uh, is really interesting. They're aware that all the colonized people seem to be you know, fighting and winning their independence during this period. Uh, Ghana, which was colonized by the British, had already gained its independence. So the former British colonies in Africa seem to be on this path. Uh, and then many of their uh, colonies, like I mentioned, Algeria and Vietnam, are also getting their independence. So what are they going to do? Like they need uh, to re rely on this colonial system because if that is the basis of their economy. What are they going to do to hold on to this during a period of time when colonialism is massively unpopular and co colonized people are consistently winning against the colonizers? Well, France, uh, for a while, they played their cards really right, I guess, and, and they were able to succeed in creating a very specific type of neo-colonial system that's called La France Afrique. Uh, this neocolonial system is probably one of the most direct kind of 20th century type of neocolonial systems that we see in Africa to this day. So they had uh, certain leaders that they had trained, oftentimes in uh, specific universities and academies that were designed to train the next generation of French um, of, well, African politicians to serve French interests. They had specific leaders emerge from these schools, uh, and they had them sign specific accords that said that we will grant you some form of nominal independence with the following conditions. Number one, and I really do think this is the most important one, you have to use the CFA franc. You have to use this currency. This currency, the CFA franc, is currently used by 14 countries in Africa, there's a 15th one, Comoros, that uses something called the Comorian franc that pretty much works the same way, just has a different name. And with this currency, African countries do not, uh, are not legally able to access all of their nat national reserves uh, within their homelands. The French treasury that's located in Paris holds on to 50% of the reserves of these African countries. And if African countries uh, want to use them, they're granted a certain percentage each year and the rest they can take out uh, as a loan from France with interest. This uh, currency system uh, also uh, creates two regional banks, one in West Africa and one in Central Africa. And France is a voting member with veto power in both of those regional banks. So while we talk about independence, there's not even really that much of a semblance of having any sort of financial or economic independence for France. The value of, these, of this currency is anchored to the euro. It used to be anchored to the, the franc from France, but that doesn't exist, so now it's anchored to the euro. What that means is that it has a fixed exchange rate with the euro, so it's always the same uh, value relative to what the euro is. So if the, the euro is, is you know, um, increasing in its value, so is the CFA. If it's decreasing in its value, so is the CFA. But it has actually nothing to do with local economies. Um, it, uh, it's not a reflection of anything to do with um, 
yeah. with, with how Africa and African countries are doing. It's a model that was designed so that France could have uh, ready access to raw materials from these countries uh, and also have a market to export their products. And so I just want to share, this is a really good book. Uh, I, I'm not an economist, I didn't study economics, but I still feel like this book is a really good like entry-level book if you're curious to understand what does it look like for um, 14, really 15 countries in Africa to not have a sovereign currency. Uh, what does it mean to be economically colonized by France in this way? This book does a really, really good job breaking it down, so I really want to recommend this. Okay. This man, uh, Jacques Faucard, he's also called Monsieur France Afrique. So like I said, France Afrique is a term that refers to French neocolonialism in Africa. Um, so it's like kind of, I guess it started like as a slang term, but now it's kind of just like a mainstream term. You might even hear it in news reports. It just basically means like Fran French domination over Africa. And this guy is like Mr. France Afrique. So who is, who is he? So in the 1960s, uh, so as these African countries are gaining their independence, at the time the French president is Charles de Gaulle, um, you know, they, they need to have some sort of system, you know, some sort of checks and balances, something going on to keep their position uh, of power and to make sure that they are able to access these resources which are so crucial to their economy. And I really don't want to reduce a system to an individual because it is a system. It's not an individual. However, uh, if there is an individual that you should know about who represents the system very well, it is this man right here, Jacques Foucault. He was, he's often considered like the mastermind of French imperialist tactics, specifically covert operations uh, in late 20th century Africa. So uh, when we talk about, for example, Thomas Sankara's assassination, one thing that's very interesting is that Blaise Compare, who pulled that trigger, who betrayed Sankara, was apparently very close with this man, Jacques Foucault, and after uh, for, uh, Sankara's assassination, he was welcomed into Burkina Faso and received a special honor and award um, from this uh, now neo-colonial leader. This is a man who um, has publicly confessed to uh, poisoning revolutionaries in Cameroon, to um, trying to destabilize the economy of Guinea-Conakry, because Guinea was the only country that rejected the CFA franc currency uh, at independence and said that they want their own currency. So he worked very hard to destabilize their economy, to print counterfeit banknotes, to flood the economy, uh, to try to destroy Guinea, um, send in spies to encourage people to revolt against the government. Um, that was, he was really the man in charge, as well as um, there was recently, I don't know if, have any of you heard of like a coup in Gabon happening, anyone here recently? There was recently a, another coup in Central Africa. The, the man who was overthrown was a long time uh, like family friend of Jacques Foucault. So he established close relationships with African leaders who were able to you know, make certain deals where they could enrich themselves while also um, making sure that the majority of, uh, of uh, their nation's uh, resources flowed towards France uh, and towards the West in general. So he is a really, really important figure who upholds this system of French domination uh, across the African continent for, for years and years and years uh, throughout the 20th century. And then coming into more recent times, when we talk about French neocolonialism and La France Afrique, uh, we start to look more also at military occupation within the region. So. Um, I'm sure some people here are, are at least somewhat aware that um, in uh, around 2014, there was an invasion of Libya, a country in North Africa, um, which had a leader, Muammar Gaddafi, who was assassinated. Um, European and North American countries, specifically NATO, this uh, NATO alliance, came together to uh, overthrow Gaddafi um, and to reverse the government within Libya. And that has had dire consequences for the African continent as a whole. So when we talk about the importance, why do, Af like, why do African countries talk about unity? Why is unity a solution? I think it's a really clear example because when something happens in one part of Africa, it just spills over and uh, impacts the lives of millions of people across the continent. 
So when uh, Gaddafi was assassinated and his government was overthrown, there was a power vacuum. And to some extent, there really it still is a power vacuum. Libya right now doesn't really have uh, that much uh, in, in the way of a state right now. Uh, it's really just been um, in a chaotic state since that NATO uh, invasion. So when Gaddafi was overthrown, people were able to easily access the government's arm stash and grab weapons and bring those weapons into the Sahel. And that is how a lot of the, uh, the weapons first got into Mali uh, and then it spilled into Burkina Faso and Niger. So when we hear people talking about like terrorism in Africa, why are these terrorist groups, what's going on? Um, a lot of the context is also a context of imperialist intervention. There's big questions around how are weapons getting into the hands of people who are living in places don't, that don't manufacture these arms. Um, and, and that invasion is one example uh, of that case. So Operation Barque now, that was a French military uh, say occupation of Mali, which was France's headquarters up until um, I, about, let's see, 2000, I think it was 2021, maybe 2022, last year, like early last year, end of 2021 as well. Um, that was kind of France's main focus. They had, they have their military all across their former colonies in Africa. Um, so France has like you know extensive military presence, but Mali was like like a headquarters for them. In the same way, Niger has been a headquarters for U.S. military operations. Um, also, over the past um, yeah, a couple decades or a decade or so now, it's maybe like. 10, 15 years, especially in the past decade. And so uh, there are three French, uh, sorry, three US bases that operate in Niger. Um, the most, probably the most important is this one here in Agadez. It is a massive drone base. It's the second biggest drone base in Africa. It was built, I think, six years ago or so, and it cost like millions of dollars to build. So just so you know, like when you pay taxes, like that's, right. that's where your money's going mm -hmm. to. Uh, it's not wanted, it's not needed, but that's where your money's going to. Um, this, it, you, it's kind of cut off on the screen, but this base is way lesser known. It's in the north of Niger near the Libyan border, and that's run by the CIA. Um, I don't know if it's even a well-known thing that the CIA does have their own drone bases, but they do, and, and they're in Niger. Um, so, I also want to give a little bit of context when we talk about the military operations in the Sahel of what exactly, what part of the world we're talking about and like where are, where are these, um, like where is this violence happening, where is it occurring? Because I think it's so important, it's so significant to realize that these places that have been occupied, this, these places that have been invaded where there's mass fighting and uh, large-scale fighting and violence um, and warfare right now are also some of Africa's most important historical and cultural sites like I would say you know not even Africa but really for humanity these are like world heritage sites so we have for example Timbuktu which is now um, almost inaccessible uh, like I don't think any of us really could go there uh, at this point because it's under siege um, because of this, uh, this fighting and this warfare. And then we have Agadez, which I mentioned, is uh, another important like, uh, medieval city that, again, is, is under occupation. That is where the United States chose to build their second largest base on the African continent. So why? Like, why, what is the, what's the big deal? Like, why is, Afri why is uh, the United States and why is France out here spending, you know, so much of your money, right, trying to go cause havoc in this part of the world. Like, what is the point, you know? And um, this, is, this is a really important thing to understand. We have a context in which um, the resources of this region are used for the benefit of people outside of this region, specifically, especially in Western countries like France, like the rest of the European Union, and like the United States. Um, I really like this image because the Eiffel Tower is considered, you know, um, a super beautiful, important, you know, tourist destination, also considered like a world heritage site for humanity. But I don't think most people realize 
when the Eiffel Tower is lit up at night, they use uranium that comes from Niger. So Niger has one of the world's largest uranium supplies, um, but it's also, at the same time, one of the countries with the least amount of electricity in, uh, in, in just regular households. It's very common in Niger, in Mali, and in Burkina Faso to meet people who have never lived with electricity. Um, that is the overwhelming majority of the population in Niger. So we're talking about like maybe 10% of people who have access to electricity in their homes, mostly in the capital city, um, but the vast majority of the country does not. At the same time, one out of every three households in France uses, um, your, um, has like an uh, electricity supply thanks to Niger's uranium. So that uranium is used to electrify one out of every three houses in France, um, but the majority of the population doesn't have any access at all to electricity. So that's really the dynamic uh, that people have become hyper aware of across the Sahel region. In Burkina Faso, the resources are um, often like gold is one of the biggest ones, as well as in Mali, but Mali also has uranium. So people are very aware that these countries have a lot of resources. These re resources are crucial. They're necessary resources to live in the modern world as we know it. But the people who live there and who work in these mines, mind you, do not have access to any of the, uh, both the profit or the outcome or the finished products uh, coming out of the exploitation of these resources. Okay. Um, okay, so why don't I just, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Burkina Faso really quick. Um, Maybe real quick, I'll just do like maybe another vibe check to see if there's any questions so far. And then I'll talk a little bit more about like, how did these protests exactly start? What exactly is going on? Like we heard people talking about France and Russia and leaders and this and that. But why don't we just talk about the history if you have any questions? Um, oh, well, I was, I, I was actually going to ask about uh, if you know how come the people of Burkina Faso want to ally with Russia, what they expect to get from partnership with Russia. Okay, okay. Um, I'm trying to think, should I? I think I'm gonna come to that. I think it'll make more sense if I address it in the second okay. part. So, um, yeah. Is, are there any other questions? I'm gonna announce this and I'll just pass these out. Okay, yeah, we also have some, uh, some stuff going around. Uh, so I'll talk about this also in a second, but I think it'll be good if you, I'll mm -hmm. talk about these. Um, yeah, why don't I just keep going and then I think, cause it'll, I think all of these will come up. Okay, so, um, so Blaise Compare, uh, I mentioned his name a couple of times, and I'll just, as a reminder, he was the person who uh, was the most sort of immediately responsible for Puma Sankara's assassination, the revolutionary leader from the 1980s. He was in power for 27 years, um, so from, um, from 87 to uh, 2014, he was the president of Burkina Faso. Uh, obviously, like not democratically elected, nor was he popular, but it was an era of very intense repression. It was very hard to speak very honestly and openly about some of what I had just went over. So both the Sankara era, like talking about the revolution, it was very hush-hush during this time period. Uh, people still... I don't want to give the impression that people didn't resist because they still did. So when I talk to uh, my comrades who are in Burkina Faso, they grew up, uh, for example, in their elementary schools, protesting on the streets with their teachers. They would go out every year, have like some days off from school to go into the streets and, and cry justice for Thomas Sankara. So people really did still resist and try to fight back, but it was a lot harder and the repression was um, sometimes very severe. There were, um, there's some, were high profile assassinations during the time of certain journalists uh, Norbert Zongo is the best example, who uh, was killed for speaking up about uh, the Compare regime, about the corruption, uh, and about Sankara and assassination. So it was a period of a very intense repression up until 2013. But in 2014, Burkina Faso had an insurrection, and the people rose up in huge numbers. They declared themselves the children of Thomas Sankara, um, and they got together and they were able to force Blaise Compare to resign. 
Uh, and so we see a big change in the political context and situation post-2014. The next person that comes to power, you know, he, he's not Blaise Compaoré, and things really aren't as oppressive, but he's also no Sankara. And, you know, I think this is a context where the, the Sankara era, where people are um, engaged and organized collectively to fight to defend um, Africa, to, to fight to defend their resources and their sovereignty, to have an active role in revolutionary struggle is so fresh in people's minds. Like it's the 1980s, so there's so many people who are who were around during that era who remember it very well. And you know, they, they come together, they overthrow Blaise Compaoré, and they're ready for Sankara. But they don't have that organization or that leadership at the time. So even though they fight hard, they get rid of Blaise Compaoré, in the end, he is replaced by um, somebody who, you know, is slightly less repressive, but also nothing's really changing, right? Their resources are not benefiting them still. Um, they're still under the same system of French exploitation. The French military is, um, is occupying Burkina Faso, um, and they are experiencing some of the same violence that other countries in the region are experiencing, so people are really not satisfied. <clears throat> um, but then something happens that changes pretty much, you know, for the, at this point we can say it has changed the course of history in this moment within this Sahel region of Africa, and that was a coup that happened in Mali. This happened in 2020, um, and a leader came to power named Asimi Goita, and Asimi Goita immediately started to show some signs that he uh, was not willing to continue with that same relationship with France. Um, he was responding to people's um, dissatisfaction, really their, um, their outcries against violence that was tied to French occupation. And so he comes to power and we start to see immediate changes outside of this context where France specifically has had a stronghold in the country for so long. I think, yeah, so this will give you like a little bit of an overview of some of what's happened. It's been a lot, but some of it. So uh, in the course of the past two years now, Mali has changed its official language. So it's no longer um, a country that has French as its official language. It, it holds 13 African languages share the status of official language. Um, France was ordered to leave, like the French troops left the country um, in August of last year. The French ambassador was expelled from the country. Um, French media, uh, so French media has also been banned. Certain French media sites have been banned, such as um, Radio France International and France 24, which have been actively spreading um, disinformation about you know, what's happening in the Sahel and painting these regimes as unpopular or as, a, uh, as oppressive, which really is not the case um, on the ground. These are massively popular leaders. This is, these are ma it's a massively popular um, supported movement that's going on. Um, and then he also uh, ordered French NGOs to leave the country. So there's been a strategy, increasing strategy in recent years of using NGOs to sort of infiltrate countries and destabilize them. So for example, um, the United States will fund certain uh, NGOs in Cuba that are saying like down with the revolution. It's just become, even like, you know, in, in contexts like Libya, we can look and see that uh, there are certain types of NGOs um, that receive certain kinds of funding. Uh, that are linked to regime change efforts. And so uh, these are some of, the, some of the moves that Mali has taken. Uh, and these, again, are all very supportive, popular moves that the country, that the government has, um, has made. And I would say most importantly, they were, they were policy decisions that came first and foremost from the grassroots level. So they, these uh, start as demands um, from the people before they reach the level of the heads of state. Um, who take them up. Okay. I had a question. Okay. Can I? Okay. I was wondering about the fact that when I see it in the media, like when they talk about Maori, there's oftentimes information on mass exodus, guerrilla war. What does that entail and what does that mean? 
Okay, well, I'm missing something there. This, I think, this video, I think, will actually help also. So let me play this, and then I'll answer that question. Um, so this is this is a um, this is a minister of foreign affairs uh, who was speaking at the United Nations General Assembly last year um, to yeah the people of the world at the UN, um, explaining what's going on with the situation between Mali and France. And I think it's going to touch because he talks a little bit. Obscurantism de la jeune française nostalgique de pratiques néocoloniales condescendantes, réalistes et revanchantes qui a commandité et prémédité des sanctions inédites, illégales, illégitimes et inhumaines de la CDAO et de l'UMOA contre le Mali et mon pays. Après plus de dix ans d'insécurité et en fait des milliers de morts, autant de réfugiés et de dépassés internes, n'est-ce pas un sacrilège de mettre une population malienne victime de l'insécurité dans un pays enclavé sous embargo pendant sept mois en procédant à la fermeture des frontières et la saisie des comptes financiers du Mali. Grâce à sa résilience et à la solidarité des pays amis et des peuples africains, le peuple malien a tenu et a déjoué le pronostic de ses adversaires. Obscurantisme de la jeune française qui s'est rendu coupable d'instrumentalisation des différences ethniques, en oubliant si vite sa responsabilité dans le génocide contre les Tutsis au Rwanda, coupable également de tenter désespérément de diviser les Maliens, enfants d'une même famille. Enfin, obscurantisme de la jeune française, qui a violé l'espace aérien malien en y faisant voler des vecteurs aériens, tels que des drones, des hélicoptères militaires et des avions de chasse, plus d'une cinquantaine de fois, en apportant des renseignements, des armes, des munitions aux groupes terroristes. Ok, donc, so, um, je ne don't remember I pas si je l'ai mentionné dans cette vidéo, mais le Mali est l'un des gouvernements qui a parlé très publiquement sur le rôle que la NATO a joué spécifiquement dans la création de proliférer le terrorisme in the Sahel region, beginning first with the invasion of Libya, which led to blowback uh, and br basically brought in weapons into the Sahel to begin with. But what I think is really important here is that at the level of the United Nations, Mali is publicly saying that they have evidence of France uh, providing terrorist organizations that they claim to be fighting against with arms, ammunition, and intelligence. And that's a very bold claim to be making at this sort of level. Of course, you know, Mali uh, at the time, this was last year, was demanding an audience um, but, uh, and wanted to actually have a, a specific assembly on this. But because uh, France is a member of the Security Council, uh, that, was, that was not um, an effective way of bringing this to the attention, um, I guess, of the, of the United Nations or on the world stage. Um, but this has been... I think, do I have a question? Oh. Okay, this, this is going to come up a little bit later again. Um, but this has been uh, sort of an ongoing uh, claim, both on the level of heads of states, but also among the people who are saying that they are witnessing that, uh, you know, these militaries that are claiming to be out in the Sahel fighting against these terrorist organizations are also making certain deals with them. They're also getting arms into the hands of some of these groups that they claim to be fighting against. So we do see that there's this havoc. There is, uh, I, I don't want to make it sound like there's not warfare in the region. There is in certain parts, um, in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. There is a, 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 a very um, like critical security crisis uh, that is displacing people um, that is threatening the lives of people and that is leading also to these uprisings where people are saying that they are not willing uh, to tolerate uh, you know, living in a state that A, won't defend them or B, working with these countries that claim to have been protecting them for so long but they're saying, you know, we're seeing that that's not at all what's happening. We're seeing that we, you know, we're seeing that people have witnessed uh, certain collaborations happening uh, that really should not have been happening. Uh, and, and we've seen that you know, these uh, military occupations have actually escalated the amount of warfare uh, since they've been here. Does that kind of answer the question? Okay. Yeah, I was just going to raise, I, I think uh, for some, their class will end in about 10 minutes. 
So maybe if you take a few more minutes to wrap up, we could go into question and answer. Okay, okay, sure. So why don't I quickly go through this. So basically, Burkina Faso um, also had a coup following the one in Mali. I can't see, tell that I'm blocking it. In which the, uh, the government also took very similar positions that the Malian government took, kicking out the French military, uh, French media, etc. And I don't think I'll have time to play this, but it's so really uh, exciting and important. Um, sorry. Okay, so they are calling for an, uh, a federation of African states in this vision of a United States of Africa, like was mentioned with uh, Modibo Keita, Marcus Garvey, etc., saying that these countries should band together and unify uh, in any way that they can, uh, and that any African state is open to joining them. Um, and then Niger is the most recent to have had a coup, again, uh, going in this direction now much more quicker, more more quickly than Mali and Burkina Faso already immediately, this was in late August, has expelled uh, the French military, is fighting to kick out the French ambassador who's like, I'm not going home, but they, kick, uh, they cut the electricity to his embassy and they're like, you are going home, pack your things. Um, so we're seeing this back and forth. Uh, and again, we're seeing that this is massively popular. Um, and, and, and very supportive. And so I wanna talk on the question about Russia, and I also really need to mention the sanctions in Niger. So why don't I address your question first, and then I'll wrap up uh, with this. Oh, okay. So the people in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger recognize that they are integrated into a world economy, into a global economy, um, and that there's not really any choice uh, in the present, if, if you're going to be part of a global economy or not, you, you kind of just are. And for the past, you know, 400, 500 years, that global economy ha has been designed and set up to, to privilege uh, Western European states as well as um, certain, uh, like, Western European descendant, I don't know, satellite states like the United States and Canada. Um, those are the countries that have benefited tremendously from uh, Africa's resources uh, since you know, the 19th century onward and really since you know, the, the, the slave trade. Um, so what people are saying is that they want to create strategic geopolitical alliances that can get them out of that situation um, so long as they don't have to be in a situation where they, for example, have uh, another country imposing a currency on them or holding their reserves uh, you know, overseas, or a country saying that, okay, um, we're gonna build like a base here, whether or not it's popular with the people. They're saying we need to form some sort of strategic alliance that can get us out of this context. And right now, um, we're seeing a world that for so long has been dominated by Western Europe, United States, Canada, um, for the first time with like, you know, at least since the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, another sort of pole emerging. Um, have people here heard of BRICS? Is that familiar with folks? Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. They are forming a, a, a union, an alliance also to challenge the dominance and the power of uh, the G7 countries, these Western European countries, the US, Canada, as I mentioned. And so African people are overwhelmed on the continent especially in the Sahel, are overwhelmingly in favor of moving towards this sort of an alliance because they don't really have that same history with Russia of like Russia, um, you know, invading them, assassinating leaders, um, you know, rigging elections, all of this stuff that is already kind of declassified and well known with the relationship to the United States and with Europe. And so I just, I really want to conclude at least mentioning that this, there are some really brutal sanctions that are being imposed on these countries right now. Um, the United States has so far sanctioned Mali, and I think it's really important to mention because I am in the US right now. Um, we have not yet seen the US sanction Burkina Faso or Niger, but we are sort of holding our breath and, and, and waiting to see, you know, will those sanctions come? Niger has been slapped with very brutal sanctions from ECOWAS, that's the Economic Community of West African State. So we see that outside of Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, all of the other West African countries are pretty much allied and in the camp of the West and have been you know, having these sort of deals with the West against their people for decades and decades. And these states 
have been encouraged directly by the government of France and the U.S. who have spoken and said, you should invade Niger on our behalf. You know, you should impose sanctions um, on Niger. And they have, uh, at least with the sanctions, and they're threatening to invade Niger militarily. So I mentioned only 10% of Niger has electricity. Right now, that 10% hardly even has the lights on at, uh, in, in the capital city either because um, electricity has been one of the things that's been cut due to these new sanctions. Uh, the prices of basic products have, has already skyrocketed for people. Um, we're talking about uh, really one of the poorest countries in the world. It's the second poorest and, like I said, very resource rich. And we're having you know, these, these very wealthy states that are bullying Niger and telling Niger you know, that you have to submit to the kind of leadership we want for you. Um, and basically tormenting a state that's been tormented um, for hundreds of years now. And so I do, we do have a declaration against the sanctions on Niger that's signed by 55 Pan-African organizations worldwide, uh, including the APRP. Um, so if you ha haven't picked one up yet, you should pick it up, or I can give one to you. Um, and then real quick, I do want to talk a little bit about the work we do in Burkina Faso. So as was mentioned in my bio, um, I am um, a part of and one of the co-founders of the Thomas Sankara Center for African Liberation and Unity. So we are a pan-African political education center and lending library. So a lot of people, as you saw in the protests, are um, like really riled up right now. There's a really heightened level of consciousness. People remember the Thomas Sankara era and people, um, they can begin to feel like they can taste the liberation of Africa, the sovereignty um, of their people, ac uh, having access to their resources, and also unity between their people. Um, the relationship between Malians, Burkina Bay, Nigerians, and other Africans is so strong. Many people have families on both sides of the borders before they were divided. And so there's a strong, strong desire to unite on the part of the people. They are really pushing for a united Africa, and they want um, uh, they want to be able to be engaged in the struggle, but there's very, very limited resources. So I see you have like a wonderful library here where uh, you get to read about uh, various political topics. I know our comrade Akabunu mentioned uh, a library at the beginning of this presentation, uh, but libraries are pretty rare in uh, Burkina Faso and uh, most of the Sahel, especially ones that have like Pan-African content, political content, they're almost non-existent. The Thomas Sankara Center is the only one that I know of in the entirety of Burkina Faso. So even though people are very interested in this history of Pan-Africanism and very inspired by these African revolutionaries, there's not actually a place that they can go to to learn about um, this history or to learn about, you know, like the book that I showed with the CFI Frank, we have it in French, but there's no place outside of the Thomas Sankara Center where people can access that, uh, that stuff. So we uh, have created a space to make this sort of materials available to the general public. They can come, they can check it out. Uh, we have hundreds of books there that talk about uh, Pan-Africanism. We have Malcolm X and Asada. We have Kwame Nkrumah. We have Fanon, you know, Sankara, all of them. We have um, children's program, I wanted to play this, I don't think I'll have the time, but we have like a Young Pioneers program where children come uh, every week to talk about to le and learn about Pan-Africanism. So this is like a little poem um, that they did about African unity um, with the diaspora on the continent. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we are involved in on the ground. Um, and so I also want to encourage you, sorry, to pick this up if you haven't already. Um, and to you know, become familiar with our work. So we have our Instagram page um, and our Facebook, as well as our Patreon, Cash App, and GoFundMe. So we are 100% uh, grassroots funded. Like a few years ago, I swear I was just like a college student, like all of you, and like I just, um, you know. So we, I don't have like a, like a foundation or like any sort of like. Uh, we don't have like grant funding. I had a little bit of funding when I finished my studies, like. Um, from the university and that, that ended after like a few months. So we are really just supported by people um, all over the world who want to be in solidarity, who want to you know, give a few dollars every month. It just goes such a long way. You know, we are able to pay our rent, we're able to do programming with the kids, we got them like little berets and uniforms so they can feel part of the revolution, which they are a part of, um, and to you know, keep bringing books in uh, and stuff like that. So if you are at all interested, I really want to encourage you uh, to pick this up, and now I want to take questions because I know we're super tight on time. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know I give a lot of information, and like I said, it's really hard for me to gauge. Like I'm really like in a context where we're super in it, you know, and so everybody is like talking about this all the time where I live, and like this is kind of like my day to day. So it's really hard to know like. Okay, outside of that, like what are people familiar with and like what information is the most helpful for folks? So yeah, any questions you have, I'm really happy to address. And the fact that this is a university campus, you know, it's, it's, it's appreciated uh, and should be absorbed, you know, uh, by students. Because frankly, that's your job. You know, your job is to come here, get information, help the masses of our people be they in South Central Los Angeles, Oakland, or wherever, help them understand because of America, as is on the verge of going to war with Africa, how many of you have brothers and sisters that are in the military that you would not want to see going to fight Africans in Africa fighting for uh, independence still from, from French colonialism or U.S. imperialism, you know? Um, and I recall, I wasn't there, but in 1935 when they attacked Ethiopia. <laughs> and, um, you know, Africans here were signing up to fight on Ethiopia's side. They weren't fighting to sign up on the, on the side of the aggressors, which were Western Europeans. So, uh, and the same with Zimbabwe. Uh, people were signing up to fight with ZANU against, you know, British imperialism. They weren't signing up to fight for uh, American imperialism and U UN and NATO. So these are very critical times and we have to have our, our, our hand and our ear on the pulse of what is happening in the world and with Africa. Yeah, so it's so important. And just to say real quick and then I'll, I'll uh, give your question. But yeah, it's just like the context there, like just to give you an idea, like I'm really spending my time around people who are like 16, 17, 18, 19 years old saying that like I want to die you know, to liberate my people. Like, we've, we've had enough. Like, I, I want to be on the front lines and give my life um, so that we don't have to live under colonial rule anymore. So it's a really intense situation. Um, you know, it's a very, just, uh, it's a very, like, intense and important historical moment in the Sahel. So I just really want to, you know, uh, I'm not in the U.S. often, but I just want to do, like, a some small part and just hopefully helping people understand what's happening. So you mentioned uh, the CDRs in Kula and that uh, Thomas Ankara focused a lot of his organizing the revolution around what was going on in Kula. So right now I'm assuming that there's some form of CDRs in Burkina Faso. Uh, how are those discussions going in regards to possible sanctions? How, and let me be very clear, I don't want detail, to save the space for detail, but I'm saying how are those conversations going in regards to so the, the, the preparation for a possible sanction? That's a great question. So I don't know if we have anything exactly like CDRs yet, but there's been talks of like how we're going to structure to have like having more of that sort of grassroots structure. We have something called VDPs, which are volunteers for the defense of the homeland, um, but that's kind of more on the, deci the side of like militarily defending uh, the country. Um, though there are regular talks between uh, the, the, the leadership and uh, civilians that are happening um, like all the time. Uh, I would say preparations for sanctions right now, I think most of the conversation has just been around um, having this very strong, uh, some, some form of very strong unity between Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. There's Guinea Conakry as well. I don't know if they are necessarily as in, uh, on board with what's happening, but I do think that there's a big part on Burkina Faso's side to try to get them kind of towards, to approach this more and more. And I think some of it is because they have the water. And so it's like, let's see if we can somehow you know, you be strategic here and, and, and do that. Uh, and the other thing is, like I said, I think this is where the, the question of Russia kind of comes in more. Also, I would say Iran um, as kind of the biggest two. Um, Burkina Faso, especially, but all three countries, well, at least Burkina and Mali, but especially Burkina has really been sort of trying to strengthen a, a, a relationship with, with, Burk uh, with Russia and Iran and, and having this kind of framework of like, okay, sanctions are coming. You guys feel it, like we feel it, and we have common enemies here, um, and, and, and trying to use that as a way to like defend themselves and their economies from what could happen when the sanctions get really bad. Um, so for example, Iran has agreed to build an, uh, a petroleum ref refinery 
in uh, Burkina Faso, and uh, Burkina Faso asked Russia to help build a nuclear power plant for electricity. That I don't think has been answered yet, but it was uh, something that they put out. And then very recently, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger signed a new military alliance uh, um, called like, the Alliance of Sahelian States, where they're going to, basically in the, in the new charter, it says any country who's, uh, there's a, if there's an attack on the sovereignty of any one of these states, it's considered an act of warfare against all three of us. So they really are developing a very clear like touch one, touch all type of mentality to defend themselves from, from these uh, sort of attacks. So um, are there any more questions? Uh, we definitely want to thank, thank you, uh, thank Professor Seals for bringing his class. Uh, thank those of you who saw the topic and chose to come and participate. Um, we've got a lot of work to do, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes being a student may seem like an easy job, but it's, it's a tough job because you are the ones, we are the ones that have to help the masses of our people. You don't get it from the news, right? Have you heard this on, on network news? Nothing. And we won't even talk about Haiti. We won't talk about Cuba and those places in the world where people are standing up, resisting sanctions. We have a, a brochure over there to end the blockade on Cuba. It's a must. They must stop, right? I think the president of Cuba just arrived today or is arriving soon again for the United Nations to vote to end the blockade on Cuba, the, the, the embargo uh, uh, blockade on Cuba. Every year, everybody in the world votes to end it except two countries. And you know who they are, the U.S. and Israel, occupied Palestine, every year. So pay attention to that, because that's really important. And they're afraid of Cuba because of the example, just as our sister said, you know, uh, uh, even how Burkina Faso modeled aspects of their revolution after uh, Cuba. And, and, and the debt Africa owes to Cuba, we can't even begin to talk about that. We'll have a program on that one so that we come to understand that Cuba sent over 300,000 of its children to fight in Africa because they knew they were African, that Africa is part of their blood in Cuba. Uh, and, and they treat us well. You know, many of us have been there and, and have experienced that. So uh, if there's no more questions, my sister Nam, thank you so much. <laughs> We had a birthday yesterday. <laughs> that was your mom here. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to introduce her. I think she's gonna go run back to work. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, I mean, just, just what kind of support can you ask for with that? So thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule for being here. Um, we can end the program at that. If there's no more announcements or anything that anyone wants to make. All right, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.